In today's episode, we get vulnerable in the mistakes that we made when growing physique development, as well as what leadership means to us and what it means to us to truly build a team that we can go far with. We'd really appreciate it, and it helps us out a ton if you go ahead and share this episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. So we'll catch you on the inside. Before we get into today's topic, I have a question that I've seen circulate around the internet and would love to hear your thoughts on it. Okay. Are you a morning or a night showerer? -er? Showerer? -er? Yeah, showerer. -er. You know, I'm not very particular about mm. what time that I do shower. I'm more, if I am in the morning, it's more mid-morning. It's not right when I wake up. Gotcha. And I do like evening showers, especially with all the allergens and the dogs and all of that, just because you feel so clean. And it's a double bonus if you shower before bed and have clean sheets mm. you're going into. That is the ultimate best feeling, I think. But I'm also, as Alex says, not the normal shower -er -er. <laughs> I like to just stand. Yes. In the shower. <laughs> just stand and just have some time in the shower. Yeah, you like to be in the shower until the hot water is no longer <laughs> hot and it's starting to get cold. That's your it's like, okay, Shower's I've been in here over. long enough. My hands are all pruney, my toes are all pruney. It's time for me to step out of the shower. Yeah. I do not shower like that. Well, I would like to preface I didn't used to shower like that. I used to not be a big fan of showers, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I was still, you know semi-clean. I will I will not say that I was a clean person before I met Alex. I was very messy as a human being. And I just didn't like showers. I felt like just the water coming straight down on me, it was just not the most pleasurable experience, maybe didn't have the best water pressure. And just, you know, showers, especially just like the shower with the tub, it just wasn't my cup of tea, just wasn't my fave. But our shower now is my fave. And so I do like to just go and stand in there sometimes. Excellent. <laughs> I would say for me, I am a evening and morning shower guy. And midday. <laughs> You're I'm, three a day. I'm big on the showers. <laughs> I'm big on showers. Um, I think that the fresh feeling that I get after a shower <laughs> is huge. It's a, it's a big like emotion boost for me. You know, he's big on showers, which means he's also big on changing his outfit multiple times. If he's showering, there's an outfit change in there. Yes. Doing laundry here is, <laughs> is tough. Like I'm a three outfit a day person. Um, I have my gym clothes. I have my morning outfit and I have my evening outfit. Then you have your sleeping so, outfit. So, so technically four. Yeah, yes. four. Um, it's just I, I, there's different vibes for different portions of the day. It just depends on how professional I'm wanting to be. Normally, I like to wake up and have a little bit more of a professional fit on. And then as two o'clock, three o'clock hits, it's time to get some outdoor steps. I'm not one to to walk around outside in chinos and walk. I just feel weird with uh, like nice shoes, chinos, a button down, and I'm walking around my neighborhood. Yeah, like I need to have sweatpants and a sweatshirt on. Be more normal. Don't don't you know bring more attention to yourself. And the neighbors are looking outside, like, why is this guy going to a business meeting, walking around our neighborhood? I don't understand what he's doing. I don't want to bring that kind of attention to myself. And so there's just reasons for the different outfits. Now that brings up the next question. Are there different levels to your shower? Do you just shower this? Like, do you no, have the same regimen? Definitely different levels. There's a very different types of showers. Okay, walk me through your different regiments All of, right. of showers. There's the refresh. Okay. You just need to hop in, hop out. You need a little freshen up. Which, like you said, you do get a nice feeling once you get out of the shower. You're like, okay, I'm fresh. I'm ready to go. And that refresh also helps if you're just kind of like in a bad mood, having a bad day. You're like, I just need to freaking restart on the day. Let me get my refresh in. So there's the in and out. That also works for washing off a tan. So yesterday or last night, I was washing off a spray tan and I was in and out of the shower, which I'm not normally like that, especially when Alex sees me shower. And he was like, what did you just do? You were just in and out. I was like, yeah, just got to rinse off the tan, get get out. I'm good to go. So refresh. Then there is the full on. There's the full you only big have deal. Two, no, two levels? No, okay. there's more. I just got it. I got to get this one out of the way. <clears throat> okay. This is my most dreaded shower, the full on shower. And ladies, you know this more than anyone. Men, I know you have your all out shower, but it's when you got to wash the hair. And you got to like exfoliate and shave and do everything. 
That's the full out shower. That one's not fun when you. What would you put a timestamp on that? If we're washing hair, Mm -hmm. like full on washing hair and shaving slash exfoliating, I mean that's like a 30, 45 minute shower. Like washing hair alone, I can get in and out of the shower, like still washing my body, but not needing to shave and exfoliate and stuff. Washing my hair is at least 30 minutes. So, I mean, not the most fun. On the topic of your hair, I want to give you some praise because there is this thing that all women have, and this is something that I learned from my sister growing up, is that you guys collect this little rat of an animal on the wall for your excess hair. Because we don't want to mess up the drain. Sure. And with that little rat, many of you that are listening, leave that little rat on the wall <laughs> and just let it fester and and like dry and then dry. Fall. <laughs> it's it's disgusting. One thing that Sue does that is a something that I appreciate abundantly is that she takes that little rat when she's done <laughs> and puts that in the trash can every time. Every time. And it's something that I never see and I just appreciate it abundantly. So well, you're welcome. I'm gonna take this time now to say thank you. And um, if you can keep up that habit for the rest of our time. I plan on it. Thank you. Yes. Um, that would be tremendously appreciated. Yes, because it was growing up of if you clogged the drain, you had to be a part of the snaking of the drain. And that Which is, is a very gross process. That neither Alex or I like to be a part of. So I try to do my part and not have that. Alex does his part too of not leaving like all of his beard hair if he's shaving like in the sink. He gets that all cleaned up. So thank you yep. for doing that. Absolutely. Um so there's the refresh, there's the full out. Then there's the half of the full out. So regardless of if you're going to do like just your hair or if you're like shaving and exfoliating, that's going to be half. So you can go either way on that. And then there's the stand. (laughs) That's just (laughs) when you need a moment for yourself. And I know that there's a lot of people that get this out there. And I've heard this from a lot of my clients that are moms. Now, while I am not a mom, sometimes I just need a minute for myself. And a shower is a time where someone's likely not going to come and get you and need you. It's like, oh, they're in the shower. I'll talk to them after. And so sometimes it's just like, I need a minute. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm just going to be. And that's that's it. There is another type of shower, but that's a special kind of shower. <laughs> I will say, Tucker, Tucker loves to get in in the shower with us, which is a a mess always. He just thinks that it's time that he can stand right next to us in the shower. He has major FOMO with everything. Everything. He has to be st- uh, right pressed up against us. And so he's soaked. And it's like, well, now we have to dry you off. And yeah, it's a mess. Um, my levels is the, the rinse off. I, I agree. Uh, that one's quick. Uh, just to, uh, Normally, I go with like ice cold water within that because it like perks up my energy real fast. If you guys have watched the morning routine episode, our morning routine um, YouTube, YouTube video, you saw how much I love those moments. <laughs> and uh, the next is going to be like a, a clean, but I'm, I'm rushing through it. I've got 10 minutes. Everything is kind of oriented around how many songs play in the time that I'm showering. So that's about three songs normally. My deep clean, my one that is like for my evening routine. If you guys have listened to the uh, sleep podcast episode, I talk about it there. And uh, that one is like a full process of really deep cleaning myself. And that's normally about- And stretching. And stretching like six songs worth as a whole. So those are my different levels. Yeah, you forgot a few because you also, showers and training is when Alex thinks a lot. And so he has like showers where he listens to podcasts during it. Yeah. um, And like, not takes notes on the podcast, but you just have ideas throughout it, or you'll just be listening to music and you have your phone there while you're showering to be able to like capture those. And so sometimes you just go in there to think. Yeah. My phone being waterproof is a tremendous help because I sit there and take notes and make, have (laughs) ideas. And so if my phone was not waterproof, that would be an issue for sure. Yeah. But I do believe there are many different types of showers and there are also You know, each person has their preference on when they like to shower, do their thing, what fits in their schedule. And this is has no relation to what today's topic is about. None at all. I just thought you guys would enjoy getting to hear (laughs) learning about showers. (laughs) And maybe uh, you'll get some ideas for improving your shower habits as a whole. Yeah. Uh, But today we're going to be digging into leadership and what leadership has meant to us, how it has transformed over time, and. 
Yeah, I think that just sharing our thoughts there, because I think it's something that in the past, I've always wanted to talk on topics that I feel as though that we've mastered and that we can you know, talk in hindsight of like, this is what we did, this is how we've improved it. And this is something where we're working on it actively, that we've, that we've made our mistakes and we have um, actively been in the process right this moment to improve those things and to get better. And I think that it's powerful to, to talk on them in the trenches of it as a whole. Um, and so let's, let's start with the aspect in which, how would you define leadership previously? Like as we got into having employees for physique development and how would you define it now? Or how would you think about leadership at, you know, before we had employees to, to now and how you think of it? You know, leadership is a very interesting topic because the word is used throughout your whole life. And I didn't really know what it meant to be a leader in regards to leading a company or le truly leading a full group of people. I had been a leader in regards to like being president or vice president of different clubs in high school, of being in charge of different things. And I always felt like a leader was just you were not born with being a leader, but there was people that had innate leadership uh, traits and they had just taken charge. And there was situations that I'm specifically thinking about high school just because you think of like the leader of the team or again, the leader of a club or whatever it may be. And there's just people that I felt like everyone was like, oh, they'll be the leader. Like they're just gonna be the leader. And so it always felt like the person that just was able to demand the most respect or have the best talent in that group, as well as those innate skills that I felt like fell into being a leader. And a lot of that had to do with the confidence that they carried, I felt, as well as the accolades that they were able to accomplish at that time. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think that with leadership, it is something that uh, especially growing up and being in sports, I correlated a ton with of just lead by action. It doesn't matter like what you say. It doesn't matter, you know, the other stuff. It's just a matter of how are you doing the job? And then people will follow you and in, in how you approach the game, for example, like how you practice and how you prepare and all those different aspects. I thought it was just really to the nuts and bolts of lead by action and I have come to find over the last two years that the the lead by action really was a way for me to allow myself to maintain a level of like being self-conscious. It, it allowed for me to use that as a definition to kind of hide behind, to really understand what leadership is meant to be, like how to really lead people is like taking taking that action, but also leading with words and and leading by action, but really like pushing the the group as a whole, and it not just being about like just follow, watch me, and do what I do because that's not how this really works. That is a um, a kind of cop out in my eyes. Like how I've experienced it, it's a cop out to me. Um, and so the transition of moving away from that's the the action is the only thing that people need to follow to now being yes the action is a part of it but i need to lead by how i speak and how i am working as a team and all those different factors plays a really large role and so as we have taken on employees what are some of the things that you noticed at the beginning or in hindsight now at the beginning that were like big things that needed to change or you needed to grow within yourself or what have you? Yeah, I want to get to that question here in a second because I think it's a great question. But specifically for you of talking of that leading by action, you're a big action person in general. Like I, when we first like got married, we were figuring out how to love one another and your love language was acts of service. And you would love me by just acting and doing the things to show me love. Whereas I was more of a words of affirmation at that time and acts of service at that time. I feel like we've um, morphed a little bit as we've aged and grown in our relationship and grown in ourselves. But it was something that was very hard for you to recognize of like, 
I'm showing you I love you every day with my actions, but I wasn't hearing it. And so I wasn't feeling that same love. And you felt such confusion from that. And me as well, because I was like, why won't he just say how much he loves me? Uh, but you were showing it. And that's always been kind of your MO is I'm going to, because you've, you've heard of like, actions speak louder than words. And like you lived by that of just, I'm going to fill the part and do what needs to be done. And I'm going to show it instead of having to talk about it. You are very much of, I'm going to walk the walk and not talk. I'm going to walk. We're going to do this and we're going to get it done. And I think that that is something that comes into leadership as a whole of you have to be able to walk the walk. And we were talking about this just the other night of in regards to like how we carry out our lives as health professionals of we have to still walk the walk. We have to do the things that we're telling other people to do um, because there's respect that comes with that action of no one likes when someone else is pointing the finger at them when they're not even doing that that thing. And that's really difficult to come from that place. So you're always like, I will show time and time again that I can do these things and I should be respected for doing those things. And so I think a lot of leadership comes from that. But I think the biggest distinction in the circles to your question is what it means to be a leader versus what it means to lead people and like lead a team. There are people that are leaders but there's people that are also like leading a team and managing a team. And those are two different roles, I feel. Okay. And, and I think coming back to your, to your point and listeners, you will maybe resonate with this is that I grew up in an environment from a family standpoint that the way that we dealt with conflict was a lot of this happened, we sleep, we wake up, everything's good. There's no, there's no conversation. There's no apology. It's just like, yo, this, this happened. Um, I, you're, you're making the assumption that the individual didn't mean to, to say it or did not mean to lose their temper or what have you. And you just move on and the next day is what it is. And so that was the, the conflict resolution. And the way that I received love in that scenario was like, the actions that were taken after of like continuing to, um, if, 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 you know, conflict with my parents of, of, um, continuing to show up and, and to provide for us, that was the way that they expressed love. And so that was just the environment that I was always in until we got married. And so then we've done a ton of self work through therapy, as well as our own, um, conversations with one another and our relationship as a whole has allowed for me to, to blossom tremendous like as this podcast continues to grow we hit episode you know 200 300 and all of that i look forward to really showcasing to everyone just the level of of self development that our relationship has brought out in me um and that the the quality of human that i've become because of you and that will be you know episode <laughs> for another day but i i will say that that was just what i was accustomed to and so that you know, led into my leadership because you only know what you know. And once you get into a place where you're really wanting to be better and realizing that some of these things that have always just been your norm, you've got to work out of and you, you can change and you're capable of changing is a, a really powerful place to be. And so I think that that's you know, one of the things that have led me to, to greater leadership as a whole. Yeah. And you're also someone who like you're you're going to prove it. Like if someone says you can't do something, you're going to prove it and you're going to work hard and you're not going to just talk up a big game. Again, you're going to do it. And that's kind of been your mentality as well of like, oh, you say I can't do it. Like, watch me. I'm going to do it. You're going to see it within my actions and it's going to be undeniable, which again, I think lead like brings so much into leadership and you need that as a leader. But uh, to go back to your question of like what I felt like it was or bringing on staff to the team, I think that both you and I have the mindset of you do what needs to be done and you get it done and you're going to show up to be your best. 
And that's kind of the expectation that we feel other people should be at. And I think it was really eye-opening to recognize not everyone processes or lives or translates things the same way that we do. And like as obvious as that may seem of like people are different, people have different experiences, they're coming from different backgrounds and they're going to handle situations differently. That was so difficult because I was always, if you say you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Or you told me X, Y, and Z, then that's going to get done. I shouldn't have to follow up and do all these other things. It's just going to get done. And I think that was such an eye-opening thing for me of I can't can't just lead and take action. I need to be able to cultivate a team out of this. And that was very difficult to recognize that it wasn't just continuing to do the job. It was learning a ton of other jobs to be able to allow other people to do their job and bring everyone together as a team. I agree with that. One of the, the things that was big for me at the beginning is that I just had a, I think, a subconscious thought that everyone was going to value the name of physique development and what it means to me at the same value. And as soon as they came in, they were going to carry that care and love for what the brand is. And that is just not true. And I think that uh, it, it's not a knock on those individuals. Like I can't expect someone to come into a company on their first day and be in a situation where they have the same emotional connection to something that for for me individually where for 5 to 6 years before anyone really knew anything about physique development I I was physique development I was we, we were making content we were doing these different things and not having any of the traction or not having as the client inquiries and those different factors but like loving what we were doing so much and being able to just push through that phase and believing in what we were doing. I have all of that behind me and like why I love the brand so much. I can't expect someone who did not go through the trenches of that, did not have the experiences of day in and day out doing that and uh, like expect them to have the same love and care. And so now move like to, to progress on that particular aspect of really showing each employee as they come in of like, this is what this is about. This is what this means and, and how much it means to us. And we show that level of, of care and desire through our actions, as well as the, the uh, meticulous nature to everything that we put out and, and so on and so forth. And really showing the, what it means as a whole to be a part of physique development. And that was a, a big hard, that was a hard part for me at the beginning. Yeah. Very, very challenging because that was one of those things that leading by example, I just felt as though that people would see my actions and be able to fall in alignment, if you will, to what I felt for the company. And that's just unfortunately not true. <laughs> and for people, I was actually talking to someone the other day and I was talking about um, physique development of we've been around for eight years and they were very shocked of like, oh, I, I didn't know you had been at it for that length of time. And so I think it is very important to talk about that of just you have been at this for a long time and not that eight years is the longest time and whatever uh, time is relative, but like that chunk of time, like you have poured a big chunk of your life into physique development. So of course it means so much to you and the vision that you have for the company and you're, you've always been someone that can dream. And we've talked about it before of like, I'm a day to day and you're a dreamer and you've dreamt big for physique development and poured big into physique development. And that's hard to recognize, like I've done all of this and I'm bringing you into it, but I can't expect you to care as much as I do. Yeah. And that is a very hard truth to, to recognize and recognize that everyone's out for themselves. And that's not a bad thing necessarily. You should like put yourself first in regards to like your mental health and thinking what's going to be best for you and your life and your situation. But that's very difficult from a leadership perspective of you're trying to cultivate a culture, trying to cultivate a team and then feeling like, people might not care as much as I care. Yeah, and and I think that it can, just as leadership is taught, like I don't, I, 
leadership is is not something that is just within you. I think that it's one of those things that is going to, as you work on it and work to improve, it's going to be just like adding muscle tissue of getting stronger. And if you don't work at it and you're not working to improve, it's going to atrophy just like uh, muscle tissue would. And so I, I think that with the leadership, this becomes easier as people get into the company of getting them to believe from day one, to be understanding of like what physique development really means. And I think that that's something that we're actively you know, working towards. Yeah. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Now, obviously, you have been a coach for multiple years. How do you feel like being a coach has has prepared you for being a leader or what do you feel like the differences are between being a coach and being a leader? Being a coach and being a leader are definitely different because with the the coach you're in in our scenario here you're in a one-on-one -on -one setting you are creating specific protocols for that person. You're touching base at least once a week, if not multiple times a week, depending on the scenario. And it is just a little bit more of an intimate process as a whole relative to a leadership position where, yes, there are things that are going to carry over from that coaching that are going to go into the leadership. But in the context of, of leading a group of individuals, you may not have as many touch points. So you're not having as much conversation or, or connecting pieces, especially when you're in the environment that we are where um, majority of the uh, employees are going to be remote. And so you've got to make a concerted effort to get that extra time in to make those conversations potentially happen and to learn more about the the person. And so that that part is is a little bit different, but also um, being able to make the connection points to um, like through the through the work and having the the meetings that are productive and, and those different factors, I would say would be different. I, I suppose. Yeah. Do you find that it's been difficult for you to like etch out that time to make those connections? Partially because of the component in which I'm still coaching 110. percent And so, if I was in a position where I was decreasing my overall client load and was making time to do that, then yes, I think that it would be a little bit easier. But when I'm in the situation that I am, that I still have a full client roster, as well as uh, the amount of content that we're creating and those different aspects to also add on top of my plate of the uh, workload of, of building a team. And these are all like everything that I've talked about. I'm, I'm not complaining. Like I, I, I want these things in my life. I want the work. I want the the aspect of my plate being full that I have to work from sunup to sundown, like that's what I enjoy. I want that level of, of responsibility. I desire that. Uh, so I'm not sitting here complaining and, and wishing it away because I, I, I know that I, I make a conscious effort to anytime that I am maybe complaining about the amount of things that are on my plate, I think about the thought of waking up in the morning and not having anything to do. That sounds cool for about 72 hours, I bet. <laughs> I bet that's cool for about three days. Because um, even on vacation, when we go on vacation, we really do take a step away. About three or four days in, I'm kind of like, eh, I'm missing the hustle and bustle. I like the busyness. I like the structure. I like the the complexity of, of resolving issues and, and those different factors. And so I, I, I think about the aspect of like, I have an opportunity to really have change in my day, I, impacting others. I have that opportunity. And the thought of having nothing is like, I would hate that. So this is way better. Yeah. I think that I struggle sometimes within complaining for something that I am grateful for or just expressing something I'm struggling with, even though I am so grateful for it. Like I am so grateful for physique development. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to lead and to be a leader and to employ people. And I would hate because I am so grateful for that of me saying like, hey, this is hard to be taken that I'm not grateful for it or I am complaining about it when I think that there 
there is a a difference between being able to speak on something that is difficult versus like just complaining about something. And I try to not full spit when it comes to like this, this is very hard. Like I am grateful to do it. I'm thankful for it to do it, but that doesn't make it any less hard on a day-to-day basis. And I'm allowed to feel like it's difficult and it's hard without feeling bad for feeling that way. Yeah. I think that it is a fine line between expressing the level of difficulty and not coming off as, as complaining. Um, it's a situation where like your, your body language and how you're articulating it come into play so heavily. And so like in the context of potentially articulating that through an email or a Slack message or something along those lines can be very misconstrued. But if you're having a Zoom call or a FaceTime or something along those lines to where your body image or or body language, I should say, um, is, is, is being depicted properly, that's where that kind of comes into play. So it is it is challenging, but I think that the the body language and, and how you're talking about it, and it's not just a matter of like venting and saying it's hard, it's that it's difficult, but this is the actions, these are the actions that I'm taking to navigate through it or work through it are, are huge. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you feel like have been the biggest challenges from going from like hiring our first coach, Katie, to now having a larger team? So when we hired Katie, it was something that uh, she had been a longtime client of mine. I knew the quality of her work was was fantastic and she was such a good fit for us at that time and she still is such an amazing fit. Love her to death. She's amazing. And at that time, it was something where we did not have, I was, I was in a place of, I'm going to figure it out. Like that has always been my mentality, which is helpful, but in scenarios in which I need help, I'm getting into a realm of, I have no idea what I'm doing and I need to have greater guidance. I have over the last, you know, three or four years have gotten tremendously better at this. But when we first brought Katie on in that time window, um, I was I was not. And I think that that's in part to being, um, it, it, in part to my ego, as well as just wanting to be perceived externally as I've got everything handled. I know how to do everything. I don't want anyone to be thinking that I'm like lesser than, if you will. And so I would have loved to have taken the step of asking for help at that time because one we were we were overpaying at that time we severely overpaid our our coaches for the front end of of our time with physique development um some of you business owners who are are listening i'll go ahead and and expose us a little bit here we were paying between 60 and 70 percent of what the client was paying to the coach it put us in a situation that was tremendously greater stress on me specifically because well, it, tremendously greater stress on both of us because it was a situation where you decreased your client load to manage the coaches. I had to increase my client load, not only to recoup the income that we lost from you losing your clients, but also to keep the business going because we were making absolutely zero dollars pretty much from the the coaches and and what they were you know uh, the clients that they were working with and we were hiring more employees we brought Miguel on full time and Miguel was one of the biggest blessings in our life to now but that was something that it was 100% just coming out of like me like my client work it had to come from there and all the equipment that we needed that was my client work. It wasn't coming from the business. And that was a, a big mistake that we had made in the, the leadership component of things. Um, and that, you know, falls on our shoulders, but I'm always one of our, you know, uh, core things here at Physique Development is extreme ownership. And in that, I take a lot of ownership by not, because li- how many people how many friends of ours, business owners, business coaches were like, bro, you cannot pay your coaches that way. And I was like, I can. Like I, as you talked about, am huge on, you tell me I can't do it. I'm going to figure out how to do it. <laughs> and I spent two years beating my head against the wall, working 60, 70 hour weeks, trying to figure it out. And you know, just recently we've made the decision of like, I am either like 
if we keep working like this, my life is going to be miserable as well as I'm going to shave decades off my life, truly, because of the level of stress as well as the workload. It's not sustainable for anyone to have. That being the the scenario, um, we were told by multiple people could not do that. And um, I just continue to say, I'll f- we'll figure it out. It's always going to work. I want to take care of the coach. I want the coach to be in the situation where they're getting paid swimmingly. And, uh, you know, if we, if we would have gotten help when we first hired Katie, a lot of the adversity that we've felt because, you know, changing pay for anyone is a very challenge, decreasing pay for doing the, the same job. That's not easy. I, I get it. Like I, I, I understand that the frustration and I understand the, uh, confusion and those different factors. Like it was a big mistake on, on my part, um, our part. I'll, I'll share a little <laughs> bit of it. Um, but that's, you know, in terms of the difference from then to now, that's one, you know, big aspect. It's, it's difficult because it, it's, it's challenging for individuals to speak on finances. I know that talking about money is something that's like uncomfortable for a lot of people. But the reality is, is that this is a big part of everyone's life. And it is, uh, whether you want it to be or not, like it is a legitimate part of every day of your life. And you have to be understanding of that and having open conversation on that and being able to accept when you make mistakes and being vocal and vulnerable in that. Like, it's not easy for me to sit here and say that I've made that mistake. Like it's, it's not, and you know, posting it for the world to see, like that's not easy for me to do, but I also want people to understand that like we're, we're still going. Like this shit's still sailing and we're still going to succeed and we're still going to be great. It's just a matter of like mistakes that could be avoided by simply asking for help. Yeah. And we could sit and beat ourselves up about it and say, oh my gosh, we need to save face. We can't admit that we were wrong and actually drive ourselves into the ground. But we had to have that ownership. And I think that when we look at a uh, leadership, some qualities that I think of a leader and a manager like intertwined are going to have self-awareness, being able to be a constant and consistent force, as well as having communication and giving feedback. Feedback is something we have learned a lot about (laughs) when it comes to leadership, as well as responsibility. Like you have to take responsibility. And at the end of the day, regardless about whose fault it is or whatever, it comes down to you and I. We are the leaders of this company. We are the owners of the company. It's our sole responsibility for the decisions that we make. And I love that we do take responsibility. And sometimes it can be very difficult to take responsibility, not only because of egos exist, uh, but also it's difficult because it feels like you're giving out so much praise and you're taking all of the blame because at the end of the day, you're the one responsible. And that's, that's difficult to be dealing with, of feeling like, This is something that I care so much about and I'm going to take the blame because it's on me, but then feeling like you're working so hard and possibly not getting the praise back because it's your job as the owner or as the leader to take responsibility for the team because every action or hire or decision, whatever it was, came down to you and how you dealt with it. And so I think it's incredible to take that responsibility, to take that ownership. Uh, But it is very difficult, especially in the realm of just wanting to succeed and wanting to I mean, at the core of it, everyone wants to be liked, everyone wants to be appreciated, everyone wants to be successful. And I think that that's something else that we've learned. And that's a question I'll ask you is, would you rather be feared or loved? (laughs) Well, before we get into that, I think that spending a little bit of time on the community or the uh, the feedback, I want to spend a little bit of time there because I think that that plays into that, but having a greater conversation on what our experience has been with the feedback component of leadership um, and digging in there. Because I know for myself, I was someone who, especially early on, was a little bit more passive aggressive within how I provided feedback, where I would more so, in, in being passive aggressive, it was more of I just avoided as I talked about within my upbringing, avoided, avoided, avoided until it was too large to avoid. And then it was like this big blow up aspect. And that just like is a horrible way of 
of working with other individuals. But again, you only know what you know. And so it was the environment that I had been brought up in, not to have an excuse whatsoever. It's something I've worked on, um, but it's it's what I knew. And so that was part of it, but I also wanted everyone to to like me. And so I always wanted, again, to come off as everything's taken care of, everything's good. Um, no, even if you make mistakes, it's all good. We'll, we're just gonna keep going. And as long as that maintained that person's like for me, that's what mattered to me sub, subconsciously, consciously, what have you. And navigating away from that has been very challenging, very difficult to move away from the, the people pleasing and just seeking validation out of externally from people around you. And so, you know, that being a massive part of the leadership progression as a whole is that it's not so much a matter of, of, of being liked, it's much more a matter of being respected. And that respect is going to bring a level of likeness that is necessary for the role that we take on. Yeah, I think that within wanting to be liked, I had to realize that by trying to get everyone to like me, I actually was hurting everyone and myself. Yes. And it's very easy to lie to yourself and say that's not the case. It's easy to be like, no, everyone likes me. I made everyone happy. But think about like a role as a parent or even like a dog parent. I'll use as an example of there's times where like Tucker gets these ear infections and he needs the medicine and I know it's what's right for him. And he freaking hates the medicine. He runs away when he sees the bottle. He hides from me. He puts his pitiful face on. And I get so sad because I don't want to inflict this, quote, pain on him. I don't want to make him unhappy. But if I were to just do what was going to make him happy, first, my life would just be consumed with playing all day with him. But it would also be at the cost of hurting him long term by just trying to make him happy. And I think that I've understood as I've gotten older of like your parents can't just be your friends. You can be friends with your parents, but they can't just be your buddy old pals because as a parent, you have the responsibility to do what's right. And I wasn't doing what was right because I was too bothered by if I was liked or not. And I'm still a massive work in progress on that. I'm very much so working on that. But it's like having that like massive realization of having people like me or doing things to be liked is actually hurting the business. It's hurting myself. It's hurting other people because I can't make the decisions that are the best for the business. I'm not going off of data. I'm going off of emotion. And I'm being so driven by emotion that I am actually hurting other people because of it, but in the name of being liked or creating an environment where people like me or like things as a whole. And I I don't know why it didn't click sooner. And again, I could blame myself for that. But instead of saying like, why didn't I know or how did I not know this? It's now I know this. And so I'm going to give myself grace, but I'm not going to allow that to be an excuse any longer. I'm aware of it. I'm like self-awareness, like I said, I think is a huge skill of being a leader. I'm aware of it. And now it's about doing the work to make the change. And within feedback, I didn't want people to not like me, of giving them feedback where maybe they weren't doing something correctly. But like feedback is how you improve. And we learned that and grew in that a ton when Miguel did come on board. Yes. And with him being in person, because it was so many contact points versus online, of we're still very much in communication and communication we have improved tenfold in the past year when it comes to work in general. But within Miguel, I remember there were times where I was like, ah, like he worked really hard on this. I don't want to tell him I don't like something. And uh, I remember just like kind of being at odds with it and having like this internal battle. And I was like, how is he ever going to improve if he doesn't know what needs to change? And then it all of a sudden was like, you're playing a game if you're not giving them feedback. You are literally playing with their future and playing with their success by not giving them feedback. Because how are you going to know what needs to improve and not tell them? Because there's been times within our relationship even where you've been you've given me feedback and it's like, "Oh, 
great. Now I, I know how I can improve. And it's so helpful in that regard. And I think instead of looking at it of like feedback is negative and you're telling someone you're, they're doing something wrong or you're making someone unha- unhappy, it's you're allowing them to improve. You're allowing them space to grow. And that was something else within leadership that there are so many times I look back and I'm like, why didn't I do that sooner? Or why couldn't I have figured that out sooner? And there was situations, and we were even talking about it last night, where I finally just was like, it's okay that I didn't figure it out sooner to the degree that we were talking about it because I was looking at how I needed to improve, and that was very helpful. Uh, There's times where I probably should have made a decision on something, but I felt like I couldn't make the decision because I was still at fault. And I grew from that, and I'm very thankful for it, and it's allowed me to be more decisive now moving forward because I can recognize where I need to grow and where I need to improve, but also within the responsibility being on me, I'm responsible for who we hire, how I train them, and how the company is run, which means that I also have to be intelligent on like what is going to be a good fit, who do we need in play instead of hiring someone that maybe I can't nurture in that place. And so like having that, that whole like everything kind of come together and click where it's like, yes, you are responsible but you need to even realize what you can be responsible for at this moment and hire correctly based on that or train someone correctly based on that. I think that the one thing that I always try to come back to is that the relationships that I have the most peace with and I feel the most uh, comfort in are the ones that I have the greatest communication and best feedback loop of navigating through conversation and conflict and those different aspects. And so, and, and I had to experience that. Like our relationship is the really the first real relationship in my life that I was able to have that. And then I've been able to take that and move that into my uh, relationships with uh, the staff within physique development. I've been able to navigate that into my personal relationship with with friends and, and those different aspects. And, and realizing that the the narrative creation in your mind is is happening for for everyone. Like no matter what, the the greater silence that's happening, the greater the narrative starts to get crazier and crazier. And then the more that you start to believe what that narrative is, because it's just a, a feeding loop of of silence of actual communication, but you're having constant communication with the narrative that's in your head. And so when when conflict arises now, because I would say that you know when we first started, you know, really being leaders here, I was I was the person that like the the silence was the way that I showed I'm frustrated. Like I'm not happy, so I'm not gonna talk to you. And the silent treatment is how I work. And that is so bad. It's yeah. such a bad idea. Don't do that. Stop doing that if you're doing that. And and I think that there's a little bit of grace here if like you really need space and you need to navigate through some things for yourself, vocalize that. Like Yo, I've got, give me like a couple of days, give me a week, however long, but I need to have some space for myself. That's fair. But just the the notion of like, I'm doing this spitefully to to make that person, you know that the, the narratives are being brewed in their head. Like that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. And I, I think that um, coming to that realization and being willing to have the uncomfortable conversations, yes. get outside of your comfort zone and have the conversations for that 30 seconds, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes of, of discomfort to really vocalize how you feel and to have that person understand where you're coming from is so much more valuable than you being all cozy in the comfort of like, well, this is easier for me. This is the easy route for me to take. So I'm going to do this. And, um, that's, it's certainly not easy at all to do that, Yeah. but it is something I highly encourage that has changed my life personally, because like being able to navigate through conflict and things that have come up at the time of, of action, if you will, and just nipping it in the butt right away and having that open dialogue, even if there are differing thoughts and you don't even come to the same conclusion at the end, but you've at least talked it through, is so much more valuable every time. 
Yes. And it makes such a better team and work yes. environment. And I think that's something I'm really thankful for within the team that we have right now is being willing to have conversations. And it did start with us creating that environment to be able to have conversations. And we've had different talks on psychological safety and saying like, hey, if you're bringing up a complaint, it's okay. Like bad news is okay. It's okay to have hard conversations. That doesn't mean you're automatically going to be like cast out by bringing up an issue or bringing up a problem or bringing up how you are building a narrative. It's that there is going to be an environment of understanding and willingness to have a conversation. And I always try to make such an effort for thanking the employees or the staff when they do bring a hard conversation to me because it allows me to grow as a leader. It allows the business to grow and it allows them to grow in so many different ways. And being able to vocalize like, hey, if you're building a narrative, please vocalize it to me. Like I have had such incredible conversations and I've been able to learn so much from just opening that door of talk to me, please, about what's going on because we all have our own biases. We all have what we grew up in and how we build those narratives. And us as human beings, we we create stories. That's what our brain does to be able to function is connecting stories and being able to make it make sense to us. And I, like, there's a situation where And I think that this is just an easy situation to um, like vocalize is that there was an inquiry and I had reached out to the staff and I had reached out to a few people and I said, which one of you can take on this inquiry because it was a special case. And so it was something that there was a few of them where I thought it would be a good fit for. And I had vocalized before as well that we, um, it wasn't that you needed to be available 24 seven because I don't think that is good for anyone to be available 24-7, and not everything was going to be very time-specific. It wasn't like the first one to respond gets something. But I had put this in a group message or a group um, Slack, whatever it was, to ask, and someone responded, and then um, an employee reached out and was like, hey, you said that it wasn't this environment of who's on their computer first, but the way that you sent that out made it seem like someone was going to be rewarded for responding first. And it was like, oh, Thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. Of course, that's not what I intended, and that wasn't my intention, but it's how it was perceived, and that does matter. And so that allowed me to grow of like, hey, think through things of how this can be perceived and how this does create a culture of what you truly want to create within the team. And I'm so thankful for people being willing to have those conversations instead of pushing it down or brushing it under the rug and just like being like, oh, it's a little thing. Thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna brush it under. But like you said, it turns into a big thing. And I always want to nip things in the butt when I can. And I'm I'm very grateful for the people that we have on our team being willing to have those conversations. If you are a, a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. Absolutely. And I think that the other getting into other aspects within the the leadership component, um, standard, having the, the proper standard in place within the staff and it truly being a standard of excellence from top to bottom and it going across all different metrics and having no exceptions to that. That's hard to really have (laughs) that level of excellence expected as well as as shown from every person um, is is a challenge and not allowing for uh, exceptions in different scenarios, right? Uh, Because I I think that for for myself, an aspect of how I navigated through uncomfortable situations up until my early 20s, I would say, is that I could always kind of talk my way out of things. I could, my, my way that I went about my work and the quality of my work always trumped kind of these smaller detail things that I allowed for myself to kind of talk my way through. And that bled into our leadership. And that was a problem. Like I was a part of a, a bigger problem as a whole from a leadership standpoint. And growing out of that something that has ingrained in me since little, like I've, that's been me. And 
growing out of that has been a hurdle, something that I'm actively having to constantly confront and in conversation be cognizant of like, oh, I'm I'm about to try and get my way here. <laughs> you better close your like this is this is how it is. Like you have set the standard. And if you have fallen short of that, you have to be accepting of that. You cannot try to ma- weasel your way through this because you've done it a million times and you can do it again. But the reality is, is that this is your expectation. And if you're going to have other people under this expectation, you also have to be at this expectation. And that is certainly not easy, but I have noticed as this has has really, like I have made a point of doing this. It, it shows through the entire, like everyone, that has been in a situation where I've had an opportunity to kind of weasel my way through and they see that I'm not doing that. Like it it shows in their efforts and the actions that they're taking and those different factors. Like of, of holding, that's, I, I think this is the, the biggest thing to take home from a leadership standpoint is that you have to have your shit in order on your side. Everything of what's going on with you internally, you've got to have that in order before you've got to be asking that of other individuals. Like if you're going to ask them to do it, you've got to have your ducks in a row. Like if I'm going to ask, you know, Miguel to be here at a specific time, but then I, Miguel shows up at whatever that time is and I'm showing up at 7.05 per se, like I'm five minutes late. That's unacceptable. Like I, then now next time that we have a meeting, he's going to be like, well, Alex was five minutes late. I'll probably, you know, five, 10 minutes late. It's not a big deal. This is the standard that's being set. This is what I'm following. That's, that is the issue with the leader. It's not an issue. It, it is an issue necessarily with the, the employee as well, but in reality, it is the leader that has to set that and uphold it every single time, time in and time out. There's no, you know, exceptions to the rule on that front. You are the rule and you have to act that way. And I think that that's probably the the biggest change of like, I can, I can be the, the hardest working person in the room, but I can also be the biggest softo to myself type situation. I can, I can, I can whimper around and do all that. And I have that side to me and I can lean into it and, and be a little bitch and all that. But the reality is, is that this is what I expect out of myself time in and time out. Yeah, self-leadership is first before you can even begin to lead other people. Because like you said, the respect isn't there of like, you don't got your shit together. Why should I have my shit together? Or even try to do like what you're asking me to do because I don't have that respect for you. Which does bring us back to, would you rather be feared or loved? <laughs> I, I don't, if feared or loved is is strong. Well, you know, If you actually were an Office fan, you would have the correct answer to that. And it's, I would, easy, both. I want people to fear how much they love me, okay? (laughs) That's all I want. Uh, No, but I thought it would be really great to talk about respect versus being liked and thought that I would take a quote from one of our faves, Aaron Rodgers. Uh, Recently on Aaron Rodgers Tuesday, he was talking about different types of leaders. And he said, there's two types of leaders, leaders who want to be liked first and foremost and respected second. And there's leaders who want to be respected first and foremost and liked second. And I think one type of leadership makes you make decisions that are based solely and never wanting to be the bad guy. And I felt very victimized (laughs) by that quote. But he went on to say, like, on a human level, we do want to be appreciated and liked. But from a leadership standpoint, I want to be respected. I want the guys to respect my work, respect how I hold myself accountable and how I hold them accountable. And that's how you model leadership that sticks and lasts. And I think that is so true. And there is a point, like, you can still be liked if you're respected, but you can also be liked and not be respected. And And like seeing it in that lens, it's like, oh, why was I chasing wanting to be liked so much if I don't have that respect? Because respect means a ton to me. I want to be respected. And I think that I work in a way that deserves to be respected. And that's been something through and through. And especially within taking a pay cut and not being paid for doing like the managing side of things of that was double duty of, hey, you're going to work just as hard, actually harder because you're learning something new, but you're actually going to be paid significantly less for that. And that was extremely difficult for me to go through. And I think that's also why I just wanted to be liked through that of just like feeling like I can't um, have lost all this money and then everyone hate me too. (laughs) Um, But within that, it was being able to recognize 
that or one thing that I had told to Alex within taking that pay cut was that I wanted it to be so evident that I was still working and doing more than enough that like the money wasn't a question. Like it wasn't, oh, is Sue bringing something to the table? It was, oh, Sue's bringing everything to the table. We don't even need to question that. And that came a lot from like your action of just like work and do it and show that you can do it. And again, I think that there's so much that comes from that as a whole, but then it's also being able to make the hard decisions and that shouldn't be taken lightly. And it's it's not easy to be the owner. It's not easy to be the leader, but it's not about being easy or you, you want to be the leader. Like you just want it. Yeah. If you cared about things being easy, you wouldn't be a leader. You wouldn't be an owner. You wouldn't be in a place of leading other people because that's never going to be easy. I think it's just a matter of consistently striving to find that place of, of discomfort and putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations and not leaning into the cozy, what's been the norm for yourself. And that is again, we've said this a trillion times through this entire episode, that's not easy. But in terms of looking down the road and understanding that what you're doing now is going to pay dividends 10 years from now, five years from now, a year from now type situation, and not falling in love with what's going to pay me in the next 30 minutes, what's going to pay me in this next five minutes, understanding the decisions and looking long-term each time you're making those decisions, hard in the moment, gratifying when that five-year hits, when that one-year hits of like, yo, I've, I've continued to put my future self first instead of just the cozy comfort of the emotional response that I want to make right this moment. And that's super powerful. Yeah. Are you willing to exchange short-term comfort right. for long-term function? Uh, and I think that within looking at uh, leadership and just one thing that I have found really important is being able to recognize if something is important that you want people to take notice make it important. Like talk about it often, make it something that you meet on often or you bring up often because that's how people rank what is important. And so that's extremely helpful for me and just anyone else listening. If you're feeling like you're having a hard time really driving home that something's important, talk about it, make it a priority. Uh, as well as with us talking about it being hard when um, like someone isn't maybe as bought into the vision that you have, it's your responsibility to create that vision and to create that environment and create that culture. And that was something that we felt, or at least I'll talk for myself of like, I'm working and embodying this, that's enough for the culture. But it's really not. You, you need to talk about the culture. And us defining what our mission was, like our mission statement, as well as what our core values were, were really helpful for us to attract the talent and the people that are going to be in line with our company that we can lead. Because when it comes to a leader, yes, there's great leaders who can lead all types of people. But really talking about a company and managing is you want a certain type of person in your company. And you you need to be able to define what that is. And if you can't define it, then how could anyone else reach that definition if you can't do it? And so being really clear on what our mission is and what our core values are was so helpful for us. And that's something that we hadn't taken time to do previously because we just felt so in line with it. And it was something that as you grow as a company and as more people are involved, it just gets harder. Like there's more people to be in contact with. There's more people to connect with. There's more people to get information out to. There's there's so many more hurdles to jump over and so much more uh, like geometrically complex that you have to figure out. But again, as a leader, that is your responsibility to see that it gets more complex and to put the players in place to make it happen and to make it all work. Yeah. And I think that one thing before we sign off for the day, I think that one thing I want to drive home is that 
in leadership, it, it's not just a matter of owning a, a company. It, it, leadership is within everyone. Like you have to, like we talked about it being intrinsic first. You have to understand that you're always setting the standard for yourself. You are your own leader in that sense. And by bringing that to the table everywhere that you're going, whether that be at in, in the classroom for those who are, are still in school, who are maybe in their uh, introductory job, or they are you know wherever you're at in life, this applies because you need to continue to uh, demand that respect by how you're carrying yourself everywhere you go uh, to allow for yourself to really excel and be the best and better version of yourself day in and day out. And so take these things that we're talking about and be able to apply the context to your day-to-day -day life because all of this is applicable across all uh, spectrums. It's just that we're talking in the sense of what it's been like for us to build a staff and build a team that we are uh, aligned with and, and proud of and, and going to go to the moon with type situation. Yeah. And we strongly believe if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And and we're trying to like encapsulate that more and more and more every day if this is a team that we are working together to reach that goal. Um, and that's the way that you can lead is by being a part of that team and not just standing on the pulpit telling other people what to do. Well, that might be part of it. You're working with that team to push things forward. So with signing off, do you have something that you want to say that you're personally working on within being a leader right now? I would say the thing that I am working on the most right this moment is the aspect of just holding myself tremendously accountable because there are a lot of small detail things within my personal life that I was just kind of letting slip by. And I am working to improve or working to prove to myself that all this, like the, the excuses that I fed myself within all these small details were just excuses. Like I have the capacity as well as the ability to handle all the things that are on my plate. It, it's just a, a simple matter of being more diligent and more focused and prioritizing all the details that I know are amounting to the better version of me. And that better version of me is going to lead significantly better. Yeah. I love that. And I would say for myself, it's very much so working on being okay, not being liked every second, every decision of every day, and that is A-OK. -okay. Um, so really working on that respect and recognizing for myself, sometimes I do overcorrect of going one direction, uh, especially if I've gone way too far the other direction. And so not making that feel like, oh, now I need to be a hardball. Like I can be me and encapsulate who I am as a person while still being respected as a leader. It's just that not everything needs to be rooted in someone liking a decision. Um, and with that, also being able to like recognize that as I'm growing within this role, there's going to be a lot more that I'm going to be learning and being able to take that in stride instead of thinking, again, why hadn't I figured this out sooner of, okay, I know it now, I'm going to go ahead and implement it and we're going to ride off with this um, and not taking it of, I can't like admit that I did something wrong or I can't admit that I messed up or I can't admit when I need help and being able to just really take those and take those to heart and recognize I'm not weak or a weak leader for needing help. And it's okay to say that I do need help on different aspects to be able to, again, help the team grow instead of putting it all on my own back. Love that. Yeah. I think you're doing a great job at those things. I think Thank you're you. making, uh, improvements in all those aspects day by day. It's uh, it's noticeable for sure. Well, I think you are too. Oh, thank you so much. That's you're, great. You're crushing it, getting <laughs> after it. We're holding each other. We're, we're working on feedback within true. each other too. We've this had a few conversations about how we give each other feedback because, you know, all those different hats that we're wearing, we're still wearing them and figuring them out versus a uh, co-owner, hus our co-owner or husband or coach or insert person here, insert hat here, just all figuring it out. <laughs> Thanks, guys.